I forgot we got noises and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we are back for another uh, episode of Few Points from Perfect. What's the what's our topic of conversation today? I uh, I can say this. You can. I can. Is this what we're going to talk about? I think so. We, we were undecided before we hit the record button. So Too late now. We're deciding on on the uh, on, on the fly here. Yeah. Well, speaking of flies, <laughs> <laughs> bigger is not always better. Oh, this conversation could go a lot of different ways. It probably should only go one way. Uh, so, uh, what are we talking about? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm already trying to catch myself. Things and we talking stuff. about uh, Christmas trees? Are we talking about trucks? Are we um, talking about business? Are we talking about equipment? Are we talking about pets? Are we talking about spouses? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we are going to start it on business and end it towards... Um, Maybe more of the equipment, trucks. Uh, let's just, I would say tools, but that could be. Yeah, wrong, I don't wrong. know if tools would fall into that. I mean, I, I guess attachments in some aspects could maybe fall uh, into that. There's, uh, that's, a, that's a slippery slope to go down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Oh, this is going to be tough. Oh, I'm putting my maturity <laughs> helmet on. <laughs> Uh, let's, you want to take bets now whether or not we can make this through this with uh, any... With a straight face with, and not with laugh? any uh, side not. jokes, I guess? Absolutely not. Uh, let's, you want to go down, let's go down the equipment route first. Okay. Yeah, let's do that, and then we'll end and, on, and a, on a business. The, the reason why I haven't covered this on the YouTube channel is it's so hard to under... It's, ho, it's so hard to explain to somebody that don't live it. Yeah, I, I would agree with and that. And whenever I say that, as a guy that uh, is a hired operator, uh, and he's running X machine, moving X yards a day, mm-hmm. um, and he knows how much yardage he can move, and he sees us over here moving the same yardage with different machines but taking us twice as long, sometimes it's hard to comprehend how what we're doing is more efficient for our situation versus what he's doing for his situation, which is more efficient, because... He's not privy to a lot of that background information about right. mode fees, equipment expenses, um, fuel, fuel burn per yard moved, yeah. and cycle speeds. Cycle speeds. You start crossing a threshold in there somewhere, and I guess where a lot of this comes from is is you know I constantly get the comments all the time. Well, you need a bigger excavator. Mm-hmm. Well, you do. Uh, so. I, I run a one twenty and a one forty, and they're they're one hundred percent correct on some jobs. Yeah. I, I do need a bigger excavator. Small percentage. Uh, but 90% of my bread and butter jobs, I need exactly what I got. Right. And whenever you're in a, a situation like I am where you're covering a wide, vast variety of jobs, you can't go buy a $200,000 machine for 10% of your work. Right. And we've personally discussed this many a times. And it, a lot of the, what your business is, is the ability to be mobile, the ability Correct. for nimble. Yeah. Nimble. That's a good way to put it for farmer Chris to call you now and say, I'm stuck. Well, I mean, there's other companies out there like me now, but I mean, one day we may be building a lake. Next day we're putting a septic in. Next day we're pulling Chris out of a field. Then we're putting field tile in. Then we're putting a foundation in. Then we're pouring ICF. Right. Um, then we're cleaning out a ditch. Then we're building a driveway. You're then we're not doing, just moving then we're doing a building pad, yeah. you know, and then we're going to put a water line in, and then we're doing some trenching for the electric company, mm-hmm. um, hauling random, you know, doing trucking for hire, uh, salvage operations. Right. Demolition. Uh, demolition, and you can't be mobile with big equipment. Right. So I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best. If anybody out there is thinking about getting into business for themselves, or thinking about how to be inefficient. Everybody always wants the biggest and the best out there. I think this also, before we get into that too far, this crosses off of not just your industry. This goes to a lot of different industries. We're going to talk about our industry specifically. Yeah. But there is going to be crossover. It is relatable to other stuff. Yeah. So if you're interested in starting plumbing business, a plumbing business, this information is still kind of pertinent to kind, you. Kind of relevant. Yeah. So, this this is going to be hard. I'm going to tell you guys right now, it's going to be hard to follow along. And I'm going to do my best job I can to explain this to you guys um, in a way that way that makes sense. But whenever you're in the dirt moving business and you're moving more than three or 4,000 yards on a job, at that point, you're in production, you're in production work. Would you um, agree with that? I would agree with that, yes. Now, I'd say... A third of our jobs move more than three or 4,000 yards. Okay. Two-thirds of our jobs do not move that much yardage of dirt. 
So majority of your jobs are not production. Pro- not production jobs. Correct. They're custom jobs is what we'd call them. Correct. Where you spend more time, I guess putting a water line in may be a good example. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not moving yardages of dirt. You're doing a very precise excavating job. Yeah, I mean, when you really break it down, you're probably not even actually moving a yard of dirt. Right, you're but talking that machi- about the displacement of a three-quarter inch line. But your but your machine's running quite a bit. Yes. you're putting hours on it. Correct. So if you're not moving a whole lot of dirt and your machine's running a lot, of, you want to keep your fuel burned down, right? I would assume so. So yeah. why would you want to have a two hundred ton ex- or two hundred or twenty ton excavator mm-hmm. digging a three-quarter inch water line for two miles? Because America. Yeah, well, because oh. you need a better excavator. You can go faster. Oh, 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 oh. No. Yeah, well, can you go faster? It costs me twice as much to move this thing in. It costs me twice as much to buy it. And it costs me twice as much to operate it. And maintain it a lot. And, and in that scenario, you're not going to outdig me. Mm-hmm. Actually, I may even be faster with a small one because I'm more nimble getting around fences and ditches and trees right. and driveway culverts and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is a random question that I didn't really consider much of. Does a larger machine generally track faster? A larger machine does not track faster. Um, I mean, every every manufacturer has a little bit difference in track speeds, and they right. travel have different travel characteristics. Uh, but most of the time, two and a half, three mile an hour mm. is is about what you're going to get. So if you're pulling a trenching ripper through a, through the ground, yeah. I but mean, but I'm might, just thinking. Yeah. Let's just say we're walking up to a fence. Right. If I got a smaller machine, I can track around the other side a lot faster. Right. Because I'm 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 just taking up less space. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. Right. And I'm burning less fuel doing it. So that's kind of my that's the we'll call that the custom work. That's my example of the custom work a little bit. Right. So then let's get into the production work, which is we're gonna let's just say for hypothetical purposes, we're three thousand yards plus. Mm-hmm. Um, some basements would fall into that. Some uh, building site pads build would fall into that. Some right. driveway builds would fall into that. But most commonly for what we do uh, is going to be your lakes and ponds. Okay. So whenever you get on a lake and pond job. Off the top of your head, do you know acreage size, say what uh, 3,000 yards would be? No, well, it all depends because it's in different shapes. Yeah, I mean, I know you're going cubically and everything, but um, and and it's, I mean, without a GPS model, it's hard to figure it. You know, some companies bid by the yard because they got a GPS model and they know exactly within a cubic foot of how many yards they're moving based off that model. How about that? Um, now that people won't see this right away, but the the pond job that you just finished. That was about forty five hundred yards. Okay, so say like a, a a decent depth pond that's about an acre. Give or take. Uh, you're probably moving three to four thousand yards. Okay. Somewhere in there. Okay. Um, the one at Rocky Point that you helped on. Yeah. We estimated that to be about six thousand yards. Okay. That was a pretty big pond. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and you know the sometimes you move three thousand yards to build a two acre lake and sometimes you move six thousand yards to build a half acre lake. You know right. it just kind of depends on how the ground lays and and yeah. what. Yeah. I'm just lays trying to there. let somebody visualize. So, yeah. whenever on a, we're on a production job, we get comments all the time. Well, you need a bigger excavator. You need scrapers. You need haul trucks. You need all this stuff and make it go so much faster. You know what? I 100% agree with all that. If I had that on the job, I guarantee you'd go faster. Assuming but you know what I care about at the end of the day is the P&L number. Yeah. And sometimes it's more profitable for me to stay there and work an extra day with lesser equipment yeah. than it is to spend an absolute small fortune to haul in big equipment to save me a day because I'm going to spend two days just getting it there. At least, yeah. I'm going to spend an extra day worth of fuel burning it. Permits. And then I still have to buy this equipment and get it to the job site. Right. So this is what I'm going to try to do my best to explain. Mm-hmm. I'm going to try to do my best. So let's just say we're going to use, this is a real life scenario, but it's also going to be hypothetical. We show up at a pond job. We're moving 6,000 yards. Okay. With my equipment, I estimate it's going to take six days. Okay. Um, it depends on what equipment's running, but we're probably burning about five to $600 worth of fuel a day. Okay. Okay. So uh, $3,000-ish dollars in fuel? 3000 ish in fuel. And I didn't have to pull any permits to haul in there. Okay. I already own all the equipment that I can use in all these Custom jobs, mm-hmm. not production jobs. We're trying to make a dividing line right there, right? right, right. So we go up there and work six, eight-hour days, mm-hmm. burn 3,000 gallons in fuel. Mm-hmm. Um, job's done. Job's complete with the equipment we got. We load up, move out, and we can be on the next job the next day because everything's easily moved and mobile. Right. 
All right. So, all right, let's go all out on this. Let's get two 637 scrapers in there. Okay. And How much let's, are you spending on each one? Well, hold on. Let's just we'll just talk production right now. So okay. we get two six thirty seven scrapers in there. Okay. And let's just say hypothetically we cut a day and a half off this. Okay. I'm guessing those scrapers are gonna burn close to a thousand dollars worth of fuel a day. Each or each. Each. Okay. Because they are two engine models. Two engine models. Right. And they are working. I'm running two hundred horse on mine. They're four hundred horse, two four hundred horse engines. Right. All right. Um, it cost me probably four times as much to haul them in there. Because they're twice the weight? Twice the weight. Mm-hmm. Now, albeit, guess what? They saved me, let's just say they saved me two days' work, mm-hmm. which is not true because I'm going to get to another point here in a minute. So they saved me two days' work. Long story short, hypothetically, you saved me $800 in fuel. I didn't have to run my other equipment. Mm-hmm. But now I spent twice as much in fuel running the other two equipment. So I've lost money, mm-hmm. even though I gained days. Right. And everybody's going to say, well, well, but, but, but you can be on the next job faster and making money somewhere else. No, because now I still got to haul the damn dozer in to finish the job because yeah. I can't finish it with a scraper. Right. You know what I mean? With the dozer, with an excavator and a dozer, it may not be the best at everything, but it can do everything. Right. Scraper, well, we're going to haul the hell out of that dirt and get that damn belt. All right, now what? Now we got to go get the track. I'm going to put the overflow pipe in. we got to go get the dozer to finish everything out. Mm-hmm. And we're still hauling that same equipment in there. Right. Now, is there a scenario where it makes sense to haul those scrapers in there and do that job? I would say sure. If Absolutely. But there's a, a big, a, big hole. And this is one thing we need to have a podcast with my buddy Brett with because right. they run this bigger equipment. And that's one reason why I steal jobs out from underneath, underneath them right and left because mm-hmm. they can't compete with me on fuel burn per yard of dirt moved under 10,000 yards. Right. So if it's under 10,000 yards, they cannot compete with me on fuel burn per yard and efficiency. Mm-hmm. Now, you get over the 10,000 yard mark or you get over a certain distance you're moving dirt. Okay. Uh, you know, we try to stay with the dozers. We try to stay within 100, 150 yards of push. Mm-hmm. Uh, you start getting longer than that. You know, with trucks, you can haul three, 400 yards. You know, scrapers, they get more efficient the farther you're hauling with them. But that's a whole other story. Mm-hmm. But at this point, if you're over 10,000 yards where those scrapers are going to sit there and run for two weeks. Yeah. And now it's going to save you a week or two and a half weeks worth of time. All right, now we need to start doing sharpening the pencil and do some math about moving in this bigger equipment right. and doing this done. So, you know, all, all, to, to, to get back to the point, these people are saying, yeah, it would be faster to haul this equipment in. But what they completely forget is it's not more profitable mm-hmm. because we're not moving enough dirt to justify their time being on the job. Well, let me ask you this. If you, that, uh, that twelve to 15,000 yard job, uh, that you could you would say that you know running two scrapers could be profitable, et cetera, or whatever. The reason could, we're saying two scrapers is because scrapers run in pairs if you want to be efficient. Yeah. Uh, they do make a paddle wheel scraper that's self loading. They do make scrapers you can pull behind tractors. Yeah. But if you're going to pull one behind a tractor, you still got to have some sort of push m- machine there. So you're, yeah. you're still running something in pairs. Uh, if you're going to run a paddle wheel scraper, I mean, they just, at that point, you might as well run a dozer. Mm-hmm. They're not. Like they're good for like stripping topsoil and stuff like that, but you get into hard pan dirt, they, you're you're back to a dozer. So if you're gonna get serious with the scraper game, we're saying two because you need to do a push pull run two. Then you gotta have an extra operator there too. That's, That's one thing we didn't even talk about. Yeah, well, I didn't get that far. Yet. Uh, but uh, anyways, I just want to clear up while we're talking two scrapers. Yes. Okay. So you have your your twelve thousand, twelve thousand yard job that you have your two scrapers in, and you're gonna save a week, just say, off of running your one forty. Uh, your 850 and Lieutenant Dan, whatever. Um, so is, are you still profiting in your situation with the smaller equipment? On the bigger jobs? Yes. Are, are you losing Well, um, that's a great question. And the answer is yes and no. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously you're not going to be there doing it if you're not making money. Right. But the, but it does start coming down to a time thing. Okay. You know, if you're doing your stuff, you after so many, you outrun your equipment and your cost per yard starts going up mm-hmm. and your margin starts going down and you got to find that break in there somewhere. Can we move 20,000 yards of the equipment we got? Absolutely. But at that point, I would look into getting bigger equipment because 
long story short, it justifies your time moving it to the job. Right. It justifies your time owning it. You know, we're just assuming we own this equipment. Yeah. I mean, could not you imagine? Not making payments on it. Yeah, not making payments on it. I mean, if you're going to go out and buy it for, if I was going to go out and buy a big two scrapers for a third of my work, that is not a very good financial decision what at do you, all. What are you thinking that a... Um a 637 scraper even goes for right now. I mean, a used one, I think, anywhere from 60 to 100 grand. So you're talking 120 to $200,000 investment? Yeah. For two of them? Plus, um, and I, it's not near as universal as a piece of equipment is what a dozer is. Right now, I'm not going to pick on Matt here. I'll, I'll even include myself to make it fair, but we, we talked with Matt earlier, and we've talked with Jerry. Could you put Matt and myself in a 637 scraper and be in a point where you're not wasting time and losing money trying to let us knuckleheads run these things? Well, um, no, because I, we don't uh, we don't run them enough to where you guys would get good at them. Right. Now, so would you pay Matt or Jerry more per hour as an operator? Well, Jerry, obviously. So you're going to need to pay a premium for skilled labor, yeah. and you need more of them now. Well, and – this may lead us into another part of this conversation is uh, scraper operators getting hard to come by because they're not near as common as they used to be. Right. So what's more common nowadays, you know, a large five-yard track hoe mm-hmm. and articulated trucks. Right. Um, why do they go to that method? Well, it's fuel burn per yard again. That's what it all comes down to is fuel burn per yard. Mm-hmm. And what they figured out is these articulated trucks have one engine in them. They can run just as fast. And uh, track hose are very efficient on fuel, sitting there yeah. top loading. And you don't, it don't take near as much skill to drive a truck as what it does a scraper because somebody else yeah. is loading you. And a haul truck, really, what's the horsepower in them now? They're not that much. They're not. I mean, a I, I 40 tonner is probably around 300 horse, if or not a 40, uh, 60 tonner may get okay, up a little yeah. bit more. Um, but, um, and there's not a lot of moving parts on them. They're pretty, they're pretty efficient yeah. pieces of machinery. Um, little maintenance, really. Not so, much. you know, we get paired or I get compared to Chris, let's dig 18 all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, you need a big excavator and a haul truck like Chris has got big excavator and a haul truck like Chris has got. And that is their jobs. I'm, I'll say it again. Is there jobs where I could use a big excavator and a haul truck like Chris has got? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But again, it's a small percentage of my jobs. Right. And there's a lot of different reasons we don't go that route. I covered it in some past videos. One, Whenever Chris digs a pond, he digs a pond. Like, yeah. he digs a hole in the ground mm-hmm. and builds a small dam. I mean, I'd say not all of them, but his average dam heights are 10 feet. Right. You know, they excavate six feet out. They build a 10-foot dam, and they go. And they're spread out a little more. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense for him to load a haul truck and dump it. And for a one-man operation, like he is most of the time, Right. It's probably easier for him to go back and forth from the haul truck to the excavator, the haul truck to the excavator. Mm -hmm. I do want to point out, though, guess what they still have on site to push off with? A dozer. A dozer. So we still got a third piece of equipment lingering in the background, whether we see it or not. Mm -hmm. So our method of building a pond, we stop off valleys. Yeah, you have a lot more um, Uh, topography terrain terrain out here. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of times we're a downhill push. And we're bringing dirt in off the sides, and we're our dams may be thirty foot tall. Right, as but, that one that I helped on was at least yeah. That. But that dirt's going to a very concentrated area. Right, and so we we go the big dozer route, and it's it's kind of a not to use a Mister Millennial line here. It's kind of six one half dozen the other. There's times where what Jerry or what uh, Chris does is more efficient. Mm-hmm. There's times what I do is more efficient, mm-hmm. but. I don't, I don't necessarily, it's, it's not profitable to own both methods. <laughs> you know what I mean? So It's the wrong what you brung whenever you don't have what you need. Yeah, I was going to say, would you consider it a smart business move to um, take a magnifying glass and look at one job and draw your whole business? No, around no, that? that's what I'm just saying. You got to, yeah. whenever you guys are watching that one video, or if you're thinking about doing a business and somebody, you know, sometimes um, we know one individual that's really bad about this. They're really bad about taking advice from people who don't really know what's going on from the outside in. Right. So you got, you, nobody knows your business as good as what you do. Nobody knows your bottom line as good as what you do. Mm-hmm. And 
in that one random scenario, that person giving you advice may be right, but you got to look at the big picture of yeah. what's going on. Like what's next? What, 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 you know, what's right, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, and it kind of goes back to, you know, one reason I don't have the bigger excavators is, is two thirds of my excavator work is, is the one forties and the one twenties do awesome on. Mm-hmm. We get, we're starting to do more of the clearing and more of the pond work, which the big excavators would be nice. And then whenever that starts to be more of 50% of what we do instead of a third of what we do, well, now we need to start taking it into consideration, yeah. upgrading that a little bit. So it's pointless for me right now to go buy a big haul truck whenever I don't have a big excavator. Right. Ignore the one sitting behind you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not technically a big haul truck, but... Yeah, well, it's... But would it make sense if our if our pond work and our clearing work turns into half our work to maybe look into a big excavator? Yeah, at that point, it, it makes financial sense to look into that. And then right. if I have a big excavator a year or two down the road, does it look make sense to maybe get in, in getting into a haul truck? Well, yeah, possibly. That can be a natural progression. Right. And I mean, it, it would make a good bit of sense to get that large excavator and then sell me the 120 for a good price. Not going to happen, but I like where you're going with that. <laughs> so the... Whenever you're starting out, your first job's probably not going to be a 5,000-yard pond build. I would hope not. Your first job's going to be digging a crawl space or cleaning out a ditch or clearing for a house or putting maybe digging a basement or putting yeah. in a driveway or I've done a lot of them. <laughs> prepping a building pad. So you get the equipment sized right for do that. Right. Now – everybody's going to take on jobs bigger than what their equipment is. And that's how you keep working up the ladder, Mm -hmm. but you got to make sure you don't get too far out there. I mean, I've been guilty of committing to some stuff. I probably didn't have the equipment for. Right. And either you you just hang in there and get it done. So you can pocket some money to buy some equipment to do the next one, but you learn a lot. You get a lot of experience from Mm -hmm. it. So nobody's wrong when they say bigger equipment would be faster on some of these jobs, but what they always forget is that all mean it's more profitable. Right. And, I don't, and they really need to look at the, the channel as a whole, all of the videos that are up here. Well, and, I, and let's, let's just take this away from the channel. They need to work. If, if they're, you're looking at your starting a business or your own business, look right. at your total scope of work. Yes. Your target customer base. Right. Right. And your environment, for sure. And one reason, you know, we've covered this, I think, in the equipment podcast a little bit, is I don't go out and spend money on a lot of new equipment. Right. I buy a lot of good used equipment, and I got a variety of it. So yeah. I, I spend the same amount of money as what I would buy in a few nice new pieces, and I spread that out over a variety of equipment, which opens me up to this mm-hmm. wide array of work, which, one, helps me from getting burnt out. Two, helps me stay busy all the time. Right. And just like people watching the channel, they don't get burnt out because they don't know what we're going to do next. Yeah. I mean, we go from digging a pond to – you know, ripping rock for a water line to who knows what, poor ICF walls. So I like the variety. Um, you know, we've covered this before. Old equipment don't mean unreliable equipment. Actually, it might be just the opposite if it's maintained right. Yeah, a lot of more time than not now, it is the opposite. But uh, I hope that, I hope I articulated that right and kind of broke it down between custom job, production job, and then. You know, yeah. let's just call it big time. I think once you get over ten thousand yards, you're you're pretty serious excavating work at that point. We've done some ten thousand plus yard jobs, um, and that's what was that pond where the homeowner had the little the red dump truck and yeah, that was a ten thousand yard job. That was a big one, right? That was one up there in Corden for Jer- yeah. uh, I don't want to say his name, but yeah, uh, how, the homeowner jumped in with a little red dump truck. Yeah. I, the the video does that size of that pond i mean that pond that, that dam was 300 foot long and almost 45 foot tall right that would be bigger than the one that i was on about three times no kidding yeah yeah the camera doesn't do much justice yeah huh? about three times it, yeah. it, and it's hard to see scale on that that job right there would have been an ideal job for a couple of scrapers because we had hard base all the way around we had a circle path going all the way around um, that would have been the cat's meow for a scraper, and it probably would have saved us a few days up there. But again, you're talking days. Yeah, again, it's not worth. Because uh, how long were you there? We were there for two weeks, but we only worked nine. Or we were there for two weeks, but we only pushed dirt for seven days. Okay, we so had some rain and stuff in between. Let's call it a week and a half. And how long do you think you would have been there with two scrapers on the on the team? Actual working, I think we probably could have got it done in. Probably ran scrapers for three days and then total job five. 
So you realistically save two days, but I mean, if you're going to. But we would have we would have had four days. We had two days hauling in, two days hauling out. Right. So I mean, time wise, we're not getting to the next job any faster because we're mobbing. So somebody's going to comment. We'll hire out your mob. Good luck with that around here. Yeah. I mean, it would cost me. So I don't want to say I move my equipment for free, but as long as the truck don't break down, it costs me fuel and my time. I'd say to get uh, scrapers hauled in and out of there one way would be about twenty five hundred dollars. So you're talking five grand right. to get to and from the job versus maybe five hundred dollars, if that. So depending on how far it is. Yeah. Also, where are you storing these scrapers? <laughs> out back, like everybody else. Oh, okay. So that way they can sit there because they're, they're all so many efficient to run. They can sit back there, right, and uh, grow trees up through them, so you can sell them to the next guy for cheap. Right, right. And uh, how big are they? Jerry told us. Uh, so the thirty sevens are thirty seven yard. No, I mean how like physically big are they? Oh uh, well, he was talking about nine nine two uh, oh, scrapers. Right, yeah. um, scraper would be close to sixty feet long. They'd be a little. They, you can get them on a truck, so low boy. So they're. It's been a while since I've been around one, but about sixty feet long, nine feet wide. Yeah, Does yeah. take up two of them would take. Yeah, up I think empty they weigh close to hundred thousand pounds. Yeah, so two of them would take up. Oh yeah, third some, of an acre. Some real estate. Yeah, which you're now paying for. Yeah, and then they all got two engines and two transmissions yeah. and two of everything to go wrong. And Uncle Sam doesn't want you just parking it on his highway. <laughs> you know, can't do you that. You know, uh, uh, Jeff Anderson, uh, Pay Dirt, mm-hmm. he runs some scrapers out there, but. Uh, their dirt's quite a bit different. Right. And some of the jobs he's doing, he's got them. You mm-hmm. know, they're paid for. Yeah. And he's able to move them himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it definitely makes sense for some stuff he does. Like, there is applications where they make yeah. sense. Lettering's just got run, done running their scrapers over there on the um, airport job, building a runway. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they I think they had about um, three or 400,000 yards to move over there, so... That's a lot of they, they moved the scrapers in, and they hammered down. Right. Uh, now, Lutterings also has six articulated trucks and two uh, 490 Komatsu excavators, and they're on another job, hammer down, moving dirt. Right. And the scrapers will move dirt faster than the 490 in the, ex- in the trucks, but they're still burning more fuel. Right. You know, it goes back to fuel burn per, per yard. Mm-hmm. And if you guys watch closely, you know, a year or so ago when this was going on, fuel prices were pretty cheap. Prices are not cheap right Scrapers now. Scrapers were coming out of retirement. Yeah. Fuel prices are through the roof again. Scrapers are going back to sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's one thing about the old 850B. It's really good on fuel. Right. The 120 and the 140. Man, they are good on fuel. 850J, it burns fuel. But it also moves more dirt, so it's a trade-off. Mm-hmm. Um, D4, good on fuel. Skid steer. D4 is great on fuel. Yeah, skid steer, it drinks. I mean, the skid steer will burn twice the fuel per hour as the D4 dozer. Really? Yeah. What does that skid steer have going for it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're, the skid steer is 20 more horse than the dozer. The door is nice. <laughs> yeah, it's got air conditioning. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the purpose of the conversation is, is you just got to have the scope of the entire job in place there there is definitely jobs where it's worth spending that mode money it's worth spending that fuel burn right to save time um i mean i can put this and this is this is an interesting topic for me because i've actually learned a lot of these lessons just from being friends with you um and i'm not afraid to admit it that i've wasted a lot of money on businesses um now i, I haven't lost a lot of money but i've wasted a lot of money um so i started the the welding again mm-hmm. and um well, you've, you've seen some of my collection of welders at this point. I've probably got, I don't know, $40,000 worth of welding equipment sitting around. And, uh, well, everything that I'm going to do for the foreseeable future is going to come down to just two machines. You know, and uh, between the two of them, I got about ten grand. Yep. So where'd the other 30 go? What was the point? You know? Well, and those two machines you got ten grand in, yeah, will probably do a lot of work of the other machines. It may just take a little more effort or time to get it done. They'll do all of the work of the other machines, right? Yeah, and it's, it's just if had I known then what I've learned now, it's like, well, maybe I should look a little bit past the end of my nose, as we like yeah. to say, and uh, think a little ahead of the jobs that I might be going after in the future, not the jobs that I have in front of me right now. So I didn't really need all of this equipment. To get um, 
more profiting. You know, this, I mean, and without explaining it, it may contradict, contradict what I said before, but sometimes less is more. Yeah. I mean, I got a lot of equipment because I like doing a variety of jobs. Right. But that equipment is sized to the, to the point of being agile and On, universal. Yeah, you like to... You like to hit middle of the road. I can do a lot of the light stuff. I can exactly. Do a lot of That's the stuff. best way I've heard it explained for a while is, yeah. is if we buy mid-sized equipment, we can venture into some bigger jobs and we can go down into some lower jobs. But, man, that that array of work, that window right. of work is, you know, you don't take a 490 excavator and go out and clear. You take a 490 excavator and top load trucks and move yards. Right. You know what I mean? It, um, it's got to be sized appropriate to the scale of work. Just the same that you're probably not going to take your Volvo 140 into the back of a subdivision and put a septic system in right. somebody's backyard. Right. You know, where you're you're not talking about taking out a gate and, like, one panel of fence. Like, you're taking down a whole damn fence. Right. You know. So, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's just a food for thought out there. It's more... You know, and, and I am not picking on anybody because people don't do our line of work. Oh, yeah. And they and watch I, Jay Paydirt's channel and they're like, oh, my God, look how many yards he's moving. Well, yeah, he's got 30,000 yards to move and he's got the equipment to move in there to do it. Yeah. That's totally different scale than what we do. It's excavating. It falls yeah. under the excavating umbrella, but, it's, it, but it, it is so left and right. And the other thing is if you live near Jay Paydirt and that's your goal – Right. Then maybe that's right for you, but that's right. that's that's what we're trying to articulate here is know what you're trying to do. Yeah. You know. And and I and I think the most important thing to remember is bigger is not always more bigger is not better because it's not always more profitable. That's what she said. <laughs> it's it's it comes down to how efficient can you be for the amount of yardage you're moving. Right. And sometimes it's more efficient to take an extra day to do it. And put more money in the bank mm-hmm. than it is to spend a whole lot of money to get done a day early. I gotta be honest with you, I, I like money in the bank a lot more than a lot of well, things. Well, it, it, now I mean, if that's if that's your goal in business is to make a little bit of money, you got to mm-hmm. make sure you make smart decisions about that and yeah, and 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 go on that. You know, I guess we could kind of uh, maybe transition transition this over into uh, business a little bit as well, uh, because I think some of the things apply there is is bigger is not always better. No, because if, uh, well, this is a very compounded conversation. (laughs) Um, We still haven't had any bad jokes yet, so we're doing good. I would say so, too. Okay, so let's just start uh, to pick apart the essence of business. How about personnel? That's an easy one. What is it now? Personnel. Yeah. So what would you consider a large-scale business as far as an employee roster? Uh, I'd say anything over 50 employees is Is large-scale. It's large-scale, What's medium, then? I'd say medium is 25 or less. Okay. And small being? 10 or less. Okay. So 11 to 25 is medium? 11 yeah. to 24 is medium? Somewhere in there, yeah. Okay. So if you, following the same logic as equipment size, then if you have a medium-sized business in terms of manpower, can you do some large-scale jobs? Yeah. That, that's, that's a harder one to... Um, Harder one to nail down because I think you have to get in a little bit more of the detail of what the business is. Right. You know, I guess we can use Logger Wade, for example, at the sawmill. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they're not going left or right at all. They're just sawing lumber. Yeah. Like, the, 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 those guys don't go to work thinking they're going to do a septic one day and a pond the next day and mm-hmm. a water line the third day. No, they're going there to saw lumber. Right. So, I think at that point, it's proportional. Uh, within reason, the more people you got, the more lumber you're going to saw. saw. What happens when the economy dries up a little bit? Well, then you start getting more efficient with less people because you ain't got no choice. Right. Is what it comes down to. So you're carrying more overhead. That's the need of the uh, necessity, um, survival necessity, or I don't know how I want to word that. But mm-hmm. um, So I guess to kind of maybe start this off a little bit with conversations, you know, bigger is not always better in business. We covered this a little bit with my business partner, Josh, yeah, in a did. past podcast a little bit. But, you know, a small business is 10 employees or less, say a million dollars a year in revenue or less. Mm-hmm. You cross over that threshold, and a medium-sized business is no man's land. Right. Like, you are you have too much overhead to compete with a small guy, mm-hmm. and you don't have enough power in the market to compete with a big guy. You are in... 
not the best place. You're you're in a very vulnerable place. Yeah. Uh, now, once you finally cross over into the big leagues, mm-hmm. well, at that point, you got enough market share, pull, and weight that you can kind of um, negotiate in your favor. I guess would be the best way to put it. Right. So you know what Josh and I found, or what I've found over the years, multiple different times, is it goes back to what we said before: bigger is not always better. I am much more profitable being a smaller business, right, than what I am being a larger business. There was years we would bring in, you know, millions of dollars worth of revenue. And that's to clarify: revenue is not profit. Revenue is not profit. So revenue is the total sales of the business. Correct. Right. Before you calculate materials, labor, so, cost, overhead. So it would be considered the, um, the gross of the business, yes, I guess. Yes, gross. So basically, everybody that's wrote you a check and paid you a bill over the years, you add all that up, mm-hmm. and, it's, and it's that. Let's just say for simple math, it was uh, $2 million. Mm-hmm. And we're a medium-sized business. Okay. So then you got to figure out what your net profit is. Mm-hmm. And your net profit is, is how much money's left over after you paid all your bills. Right, for you. Right, like how much money are you actually putting in your pocket? You mm-hmm. taking home with, home to your family as the owner of that business? I got a hint for you. It's not much. Not much. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm talking in general terms here, but basically let's just say our medium-sized construction company we had, you know, grossed $2 million. You had how many employees? Uh, we seven. had about 10 okay. at that time, theoretically. <laughs> Let's say twelve, because then you stay in the medium. Okay, size. twelve. If we yeah. stay in the medium, which with with if with office help and Josh and I, we were probably twelve. Okay. Um, and at the end of the year, we netted hundred thousand dollars. Well, now there's two of us in the business. So you divide that in half. So you're, you're trying to tell me I moved two million dollars and only took home fifty thousand? Mm-hmm. Wait a minute here. Over the course of the year. Over the course of the year, and how many headaches did I deal with? Every day. But I can say, man, I got a $10 million business, and look at them awesome houses I yeah. built, and wow, you know. Well, hold on, how much vacation time did yeah, you get? Yeah, I'm, I'm not small no more. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm medium business now, you know. Yeah, look at me go. And you do that for a few years, and finally you realize, what the hell am I doing, yeah. <laughs> you know? So you got a decision to make. Are we going to push this thing forward and try to get into the, the big business, and we're going to build 50 houses a year, and we're going to make $10 million in revenue and mm-hmm. hope to keep 500000 of that in the pocket? Which, spoiler alert, it's it's not linear like that. Right. It's not, and I mean, it can be. There are situations. Oh, out there, there are. There are. There's there's people, and, and, and a lot of times, more times than not, they have a private investor backing them. Yeah. Um, it's hard to do it with bank money, but it can be done. It, it just depends on the situation. So, you know, we continued down that path for a while, trying to push forward, and, and um you know, again, a lot of the details of this are in the in the podcast with Josh. But long story short, it's like this this is insanity. Like we are risking so much to gain so little yep. um, that it's not worth. Because yeah, we didn't even cover the risks here. Right. The risks of liabilities. Yeah. The more injuries. the more revenue you got, the more risk you got because the yep. more work you're doing. It, it, it's that simple. So, um, the even the last couple of years of the construction company, we're like, all right, we're cutting back. We right. went down to three employees. We started subbing stuff out. We got down to under a million dollars a year in revenue. Well, guess what? What? You're trying to tell me I got half as much revenue, but I got twice as much profit? Mm-hmm. How's that work out? <laughs> well, there's a lot of reasons why that works out. One, you can just be more efficient. Two, you got less risk involved. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's just... There's less chaos. You know, I spend less time managing, more time working. That makes a big difference. Yeah, right. So, you know, unless you can find a way to run through the medium size into the large size, mm-hmm. sometimes you're just better off being a really good small business. Yeah, we're, it, it's at least worth the extra time to think about it, to, to really iron that decision out. I've had so many friends in business, so many friends in different industries, and I had a lot of good friends that started in their own businesses the same time I did. Mm-hmm. And there's still a few of them that are going that are continuing to grow. And one guy's getting pretty close to go from the medium business to the large business. Uh, but nine times out of ten, most of them started off the same scale I did, had the same plan I did, work on up, work on up, keep building. They get somewhere around that 15, 20 employees deal, and they're like, wait a minute, and they start going backwards. <laughs> and they get down to about four or five employees, and they're really happy and very profitable. Right. Um, even here now today, that's probably one of the biggest issues I have with my excavating company 
is not letting it get any bigger than what it is. Right. Um, Because your customers would love you to be bigger than you are. Oh, me, you know, we did the podcast with Matt the other day and about what he said. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the bundle, I'm the funnel, I'm the bottleneck. Yeah. I'm the issue. Yeah. You're booked out eight months. Yeah. And, um, and we could keep probably two ICF crews busy. We could keep two excavating crews busy. I could keep a septic crew busy. Um, I could feed work left and right everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's not profitable for me to do that. Mm -hmm. It's profitable for me to focus on what I do and do a really good job at it, and I, it is what it is. Yeah, and also your sanity has to come in. Yeah, play. I mean, I can I can move a million dollars a year and pocket two hundred thousand, or I can move two million dollars a year and pocket one hundred fifty thousand. Right. What's the point? <laughs> Not a big one. You know, and somebody's going to comment. Well, if you move two million a year, you should double your profit. Oh, I hear you. And everybody's got a college degree will say that. But boys and girls, I got a, I got a degree in reality. <laughs> you know? Uh-huh. <laughs> it, it don't always work that yeah, way. It's, not, it's very rare that it's linear like that. Yes. It's, um, you know, if we weren't podcasting here, I could, I could draw you a map. But it, it basically it goes up pretty good. Mm-hmm. And it's going to level off for a long, 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 long time. And if you yeah. ever s- get over into what we're going to call the large business it goes up again. It'll go up again. And and then then you can go even farther into a big corporation, and that's just a free-for-all at that point. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody's working with everybody else's money, and nobody cares, and nobody's right. held responsible for anything. And exactly. everybody's micromanaging everybody, and everybody's peed off at everybody, and it's an unhappy place to work. And oh, I can – it's almost like you're – You know, one of the yeah. – Things that we get coming on our channel all the time is it look like you guys have a good time, you have a good fun, we all work well together. Well, we do, and that's because we don't push ourselves. Right. You know, we keep we we work within our means. Mm-hmm. Um, we know how much work we can get done in a day. We know what we can do in a day. We know how many yards we can move. We know how many yards we can move efficiently, and we work in that circle. You know, we can have our comfort zone from time to time, but you got to to keep yourself fresh and and keep yeah. pushing forward. But we don't live there. Um, do you think it's an Im- do you think it's important to constantly still try to improve the business? Oh, absolutely. You've got to be constantly investing in the business. Um, you know, it's just like me with, um, let's just use Dozers, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, we knew we had some more leg jobs coming up. The 850's got a lot of hours on it. Uh, that's, you know, we covered before. We don't have a big excavator because we've got big Dozers, so... Uh, we kept the old 850 because it's paid off and it does good, mm-hmm. but we invested in a new 850, right. which gives us the option to leapfrog and be more efficient with our mobin. Mm-hmm. And then if we do get on a big job, we can get both dozers pushing and save a little bit of time because we can move them in and out quickly. Right. And then this brings up a whole other good point going back to before. So let's say we get a 5,000-yard job, mm-hmm. haul both 850s in there. Mm-hmm. We push like heck, move dirt. and get. You know what, though? If that job's over, I can take one eight fifty to one job, one eight fifty to another job. I can split them in half and go different directions with them. Right. You gonna unbolt that scraper and split it in half? You gonna unbolt that haul truck and Watch split it in half? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fine, but what are you gonna yeah. do with? I mean, one half's useless without the other. Yeah, I know. So we can team up, push, push, push. Well, we need to. And then we can split up, and when we get, let's say we're gonna split up. If we're splitting up, we're probably going to custom jobs. Right. So we're not moving yardages. We're we're doing you know a green bad pa- green bin pad for Chris, or we're or we're pushing in a small little pond, or we're cleaning out a ditch, or we're doing some clearing, or we're doing something like that. And then you're gonna get the argument. Well, but you know, operators that takes more operators. Well, boys and girls, if you're running two scrapers, you still got two operators. How's <laughs> the difference between that and two dozers? Stop like, don't talking logical. Yeah, it's like, come on now. Think. Yeah. Th- I mean, seriously, like. Now, how often do you haul the 850 in for a custom job? Uh, well, we actually do quite a bit because they're easy to move. Mm-hmm. Uh, the new one with the ripper on it, we do have to permit it from time to time, so um, that gets a little bit more cumbersome, which is one reason why I don't have a bigger excavator because of our, our road laws around here. Right. But, you know, like a lot of the jobs we do for Farmer Chris are custom jobs. We're not there moving yardages. We're, mm-hmm. you know. Drain tiles. We just need, we need horsepower. Right. Uh, we need something that'll get through the mud, so it, uh, it it's you know that's one thing nice about the eight fifties. They're big enough to move dirt, but they're small enough to um, get in and out with. Mm-hmm. You know, I 
I don't know if I'll ever haul a, have a dozer bigger than an 850. If you guys wonder, an 850 is about a 50,000 pound. 850J is about 50,000 pounds, about 200 horse. Mm-hmm. 850B is about 45,000, about 190 horse, 170 horse. And because everybody knows cat numbers, you said D6R. They're, yeah. they're pretty close to a D6R. Okay. Uh, D6R's weight wise is just a touch more, but um, horsepower and, and blade wise, they're about identical. Uh, D6R's uh, power shift for either hydrostat, but it, it's somewhere in that mid D6 range is where yeah, they're at. Just for physical size. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're you've seen them in person. They ain't, ain't, no, machines. <laughs> ain't no slouch. No, they're, they're and that's big. another thing I don't think the video does it any justice is the no. the size of the equipment. Mm-hmm. I mean, what we've got is already big. Yeah. Um, it's. And I, w- I mean, I will say that. I've you know I've been down there firsthand to Chris's place too, and and his excavator is is big. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah. His dozer are not so much, but his excavator no, is. His big. dozer's cute. It is adorable. <laughs> it's a good start. But I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you though, there ain't nothing that beats strawberry shortcake. Because I'm so proud of myself for naming that red excavator. You know, ironically, <laughs> uh, whenever we were in the home building business, the mini excavator was one of the main tools, mm-hmm. and. Uh, that's one of the least used piece of equipment we have anymore. Yeah. I mean, I got to keep it around because whenever we need it, we need it. Yeah. But um, it don't get used near as much as what you think. You know, that Hyundai HX85A, which was about an 18,000-pound machine, mm-hmm. um, I didn't really – I thought, man, this is really an awkward size machine. It's, it's not near big enough to be a big machine. It's way too big to be a small machine. And that was true to some aspects, but it also opened my eyes to there's a place for that size machine. I like that machine. Uh, it, it was um, it, it was really nice having it around, doing some of the uh, field tile work and putting in some utility work and and uh, a couple other things and uh, fifteen minutes left. A um, couple other things. So it was it was nice. Um, I was pleasantly surprised how well it kind of fit into the uh, fleet. I got a buddy. Uh, CT, CTC Dirtworks, and uh, he's got the, um, I guess it's the E85, which is the Bobcat version of that. Is it that big? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, and our E80, I always give him a hard time telling him, asking when he's going to buy a real excavator. <laughs> you know? I'll tell you, if money was no object, that's I would buy that Hyundai 85. You know, for a guy who had like a homestead or a farm or something, yeah, well, it would be... It would be ideal because you could put, you know, we only had a two foot bucket on it, but you could put a big bucket on it. I liked it for its reach. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That thing had incredible yeah, reach. That, like, I, I think about, you know, the property that we're buying has that pond on it. And if right. I wanted to dredge out the sides or something, I could pretty easily do that or yeah. hang a brush hog on it and do pretty good work with the it. The thing that came to mind with me and that machine was uh, subdivision work. Yeah. You know, where you're in a, on the tight little street and you're putting a sewer line in or something because it would fold up into a very compact radius. Yeah. But then you could reach out over top of a, a dump truck and load it. That was not zero tail swing. No, it was, it was a, a close, radi- close yeah. radius right. uh, tail swing is what, is what the, that was. The other thing to mention about a Mini of that size is the cab is roomy. Mm-hmm. That's, that's nice. Yeah, that one there has the same cab on it as what the like the 145 would have on it. Really? Yeah, the close radius. Good. Yeah, no, it's a different cab than like the 140 would have on it. Right. But um, very, uh, very. And I like that 145 too. Yeah, I, yeah, I liked them all. Yeah, that was a nice they were question. they were very reasonable to operate for me. <laughs> <laughs> they were honestly quite efficient. I just need Hyundai to build a bulldozer and send it down for a little while. We'll test that thing out and That'd be nice. see see how it goes. But are they listening? <laughs> <coughs> Do you think Hyundai? Wow, uh, what's what's her name? Susan. Susan, yeah. Do you think Susan listens to a few points from Perfect? I know she watches all my live feeds because every time I say something every once in a while, she catches me and calls me out on it. Oh, I better pay attention to that. <laughs> but uh, Hyundai did uh, Hyundai did announce on one of my live feeds. Actually, they announced it to the world on one of my live feeds that they were coming out with a skid steer. Really? I don't think you even told me this. Yeah, it's going to be um, the the it's going to be geared towards the rental market. Okay. It's only going to be seventy five horse. What, uh, what's the weight? Uh, there they be around a ten thousand pound machine. That's not terrible. No. Um, we might, for comparison, my Kubota is a hundred horse and it's about, uh, 13, 13, 13, 14,000. So, you know, and and this will kind of lead us into where we may roll this up at, but you know, 
everything we just said kind of rolls over into attachments a little bit too. You know, everybody wants the biggest attachment they can get yeah. from the front of the skid steer, their biggest bucket, the biggest brush cutter, the biggest brush mulcher, the biggest this, the biggest that. Mm -hmm. And first off, you need to size your attachment for your equipment. For your equipment and what you're going to do with it. Yeah. Now, let's point out the obvious. The super stick may be a little oversized for the 120. <laughs> You leave that super stick alone. Um, okay, so here's a good example. Then I got a, a hundred horse Kubota, and then when it's working, if it's working, sounds it, about right. If it's Kubota, yeah, it'll. It's um, God, I forget how wide they are. Uh, mine's a, mine is about uh, seventy nine, eighty inches, which is seven feet ish. Yeah. Okay, so just say I can I can put an eight foot brush hog on front of it. But I have a seven foot gate. Yeah, <laughs> seen that happen before. Yeah. Dog with a bone. You uh, you think I should uh, I should get that that eight? Well, foot brush the other hog? thing is, is a guy gets the eight foot brush hog, puts it on a seventy five horse machine, and then he can't even lift it up without the back end of the machine coming off the ground. Yeah. He's walking around on his tippy toes all the time. That's hard on the undercarriage because you're running over stubble and also dangerous. It's, it's dangerous. It's hard on the equipment. And the next thing you know, you got that thing raised up in a tree, and you go to track over a bank or something and you're face first down in a in a dang hillside somewhere With a spinning blade of death yeah so you know and and that could go on down the down the line to excavators and buckets yeah. you know i just think a skid steer and a brush hog are two two items that most people know what they are right right so. um you know, you look at uh, like Phil and Joanne out there they got um 5 and 6 yard buckets for uh, thirty thousand pound loaders. Well, they're right. loading sawdust. Yeah, which, which weighs a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, then you you see that yeah. same guy over there trying to load, you know, Stone. millings or stone or something <laughs> with it, and you're like, what are you doing? Honestly, I don't know why the hose blew three times. I tell, I'm like, Wade, quit. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could just put four more people on the back of it. Yeah. I almost. I'll never. I'm gonna tell a story on Wade real quick. We were out. Uh, actually, the story wasn't on Wade. It's on myself. I was just gonna make it sound like he was me, but <laughs> we were tearing out an old. <laughs> we were tearing out an old sawmill. Oh, I know the story. <laughs> tearing out an old sawmill, and uh, if you guys ever stop by the Dairy Market, it's actually the wheel that's our sundial we're trying to build down there. And this thing was uh, about ten feet off the ground. Bandsaw. Bandsaw. Was it the resaw? It was. A, it was the resaw. Yeah. The resaw band. And I could lift it up with the loader. Right. But as soon as I went to back up, I had to turn. And whenever I articulated the loader and right. moved the center of gravity forward far enough, it would tilt. And I'm like, so when I look over there, there's this old hydraulic power pack over there, which is this huge electric motor in this hydraulic pump. Yeah. Probably weighed about 1,500 pounds. So I told Dale, I said, let's just sit that up on the back for a little bit extra counterweight. <laughs> and... Uh, then, so that worked. I was able to back up and turn. I went to turn, and I had one tire that had like five pounds last air pressure, and that was enough to get that thing to want to kick over because right. the machine's articulating it. So we had to over-inflate one tire. <laughs> and I didn't hear all this. Yeah, it was, um, it was before YouTube, if anybody's yeah. wondering. Yeah. But it was probably one of the sketchiest things I've ever done in my life. And I can see Dale being like, well, I don't know. Michael, is that a good idea? Yeah, well, I'm like, it's too late now. We're committed. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're off. Like, it's coming down. Whether it's coming down slow, controlled, or we're fast in chaos. Yeah. And then the crazy part was, like, we hauled that thing to the scrapyard. It weighed, like, 19,000 pounds. <laughs> I mean, it was ridiculous what it weighed. And, um, like, three days later, I was loading rock in a truck, and it blew a lift hose. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where that thing got ruptured at. It, oh, yeah. uh, Luckily, it wasn't three days ago. I could have been real. Yeah, so don't. That's that's using equipment improperly. You know, don't, that's that's don't one of the, do that. That's one of those scenarios where you need bigger equipment. You know, yeah. there's just there's no excuse for using smaller equipment. You just got to do what you got to do to get it in there. But yeah, and I, I guess I mean we got seven minutes, but um, what do you? Uh, you can always supplement smaller equipment with a rental. Correct. You know uh, that the rental people ask me all the time, how come I don't rent and I don't lease? And there's a couple of reasons for it. One, we don't, we're, we got rental yards an hour and a half to the east. We have rental yards an hour and a half to the west. Right. So either it cost me $500 just to get a piece of rental equipment delivered, or it cost me three hours out of my day to go get something. Right. And whenever I rent something, I don't need it for, um, whenever I rent something, I don't need it for five or six days. I need it for a couple of hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, our day at the most so we just 
we just do what we need to do to get by. It's, you know, sometimes it's the old run what you brung. Yeah. Run what you brung scenario. As far as leasing equipment goes, you know, if you're leasing equipment, you're leasing new. You're turning around paying a premium on it. And then if something happens to it, if you tear it up, you're, you know, you're still obli- fix it. you still got to fix it. Um, and so flip side of that is if you buy a new piece of equipment, it's under warranty. Yeah. And you're paying towards an asset, not towards a lease. Right. I just, um, you know, farmer Chris leases some equipment, some tractors and stuff. And for his business model and cash flow, it makes sense. It makes sense for him to do it. Yeah. But my business model and my cash flow, I haven't quite stumbled across a scenario where it made sense for me to do it. It might one day. You know, I, I may be in a different situation or mm-hmm. our things may be going different. But uh, uh, right now, it just uh, it, it hasn't made a whole lot of sense. Nobody around here rents a whole lot. Mm-hmm. I mean, like Lettering Brothers, my buddy Brett, whenever they get on a big job, they may rent a piece of equipment here or there. But usually they're working two or three hours from here next to a rental house. So they yeah. got, or they rent enough equipment, they got a good relationship with the rental house. I tried to rent uh, uh, Taco Cucci and a Fecon head uh, back yeah. in the spring, and, and uh, it was cheaper for me to go buy an old junk one off eBay. You, and you still have that? No, I sold it. Did you? Sold it, made money. I was kind of curious because I hadn't seen it around. Yeah, we used it for the two jobs we needed it for, and uh, sold it, made money. So it made more sense for me. It was cheaper and more profitable for me to buy something off eBay, mm-hmm. put a little bit of work into it, use it for the two jobs, turn around and sell it for a profit than what it was for me to go rent something and do the same job. Right. And then it never fails. You rent something, and either something comes up or it rains. Yep. Uh, it, it, it just – and if you do have something rented, your, your <laughs> schedule rented. Or the rental yard sells it out from under you. Yeah, I, I remember that stereo <laughs> as well. And then you're driving a D4 dozer across the country. <laughs> so – and then you're married to your schedule on that job because right. you can't work on it. If something else comes up, you are committed to that because you are paying for that machine whether you're using it right. or not. I, I mean, personally, I know I suggested rentals because it, it, there is always a, a viable option of it. But I hate rentals because I hate playing by other people's rules. Well, there's definitely a viable option for it. And, and uh, one scenario I think of is uh, down there at my grandma's house, we end up renting a little uh, 35 with a hammer on it. Right. And the hammer is one of those things we don't use a whole lot, and it and it requires if it sits over in the corner, it requires maintenance for you to use it again. So if we need a hammer, we rent one, mm-hmm. um, and that's what we did down there. But in the last four years, that's the only time I've ever had need to rent a hammer. Now I'm getting ready to put a water line through rock, so I might eat some words on that. But yeah, well, um, but yeah, once every four years ain't bad. Yeah, and so yeah, we did rent there, and and we have rented occasionally before, but. I'm also got my fleet to where everything's got a backup. Right. You know, you got two excavators, you got two big well, dozers. You only have one skid steer. Well, but here's my argument to that is, is the dozer can be a backup to the skid steer in a lot of scenarios. The only exception is loading trucks, mm-hmm. and the skid steer can be a backup to the little dozer if it has to be. Debatable. It's been done. Debatable. <laughs> so, I do have some redundancies built in there. Yeah. Um, I do have access to farm tractors with loaders on them, and if the skid steer goes down, I do have the big cat loader too. Yeah. So. I, just, I just like bringing the skid steer up. <sighs> I know it's your favorite. No, it's not. <laughs> not only is it not my favorite piece of equipment, it's also my least favorite brand. Yeah. Um, we should do a whole podcast on orange. Oh, I don't think I can keep my cool. <laughs> That's why we should do it. <laughs> If we ever do that, we need to get tractor time with Tim on here because I think me and him sell a lot of uh, similar thoughts about the uh, Orange Company. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I know he, he likes green, but I didn't know he disliked orange. Well, he's he's tried, you know, the, the, he's tried everything he can to like them. Yeah. Uh, because that's the competitor to the green, and, and, and Tim does a good job on his channel of being unbiased about, you know, just stating facts. And, yeah. And uh, it's been tough for him to really – you know, uh, he he bought that tractor, and I said, "Man, I've had a few of them. I hate this, this, and this." He's like, "Oh my God, tell me about it." <laughs> and you talk to, like, so the people who love Kubota tractors have never owned anything else. That's what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. You know, if I if you if if you saved up your life savings and you went and bought a Kubota, of course you think it's going to be the best thing ever made. Right. But you don't know a damn thing about what you bought. So how do you know? Exactly. Like, how do you justify your 
How do you justify your opinion? You haven't been mad enough to try something else. <laughs> Yet. And, I, you know, this would be a really cool statistic. People who buy 35 horse tractors and less, mm-hmm. I bet you they average less than 100 hours a year on those things. Oh, easily, yeah. You know, where we average, you know, the big dozers and the big excavators are 500 plus hours a year, and that's mm-hmm. pretty low hours compared to like, you know, like my buddy Brett on some of his big stuff, they'll average 12, 1500 hours a year. Right. So, you know, you cut that back to $100 a year. You ain't using it too much. And I bet you wide open throttle time is probably 10%. Yeah, how, <laughs> you know? how much, it's hard to break it if it ain't running. Well, now Kubota can do that. But, I mean, realistically, it's hard to break it if you ain't using it. Right, right. And it's, it's just uh, there's, a completely different, there's a completely different standard between production work and residential work. Mm-hmm. Um, is... Um, and you see it in the way the tractors and stuff are built. You know, even big ag tractors are built to be used in a commercial setting to where, I don't know, 50 horse and downs made to be used more in a, a residential yeah. setting, I guess, where yeah, I mean, occasional even, use. Even the price point reflects that, too. Right, occasional you know? use, I guess, would be the best way to put it. Yeah, because that's kind of what we're looking at. We're looking at a Kubota, uh, not a Kubota, God, not a Kubota, a Coyote, mm-hmm. uh, 55 horse, which it actually it's the same one that Let's Dig has. Who's that? Never heard of. <laughs> I had to get my you dad. should check him out. I'll have to look him up yeah, sometime. I hear he's got a big excavator. He's yeah, he's on the MySpace. Is he is he sponsored by that Valo people? Yeah, he he's got his Valopian tubes. <laughs> um, that two twenty he's got is a very nice machine. I do like it. Yeah, very nice machine, and and we may venture into that market one day. But like I said, the workload's got to the workload's got to justify owning it, mm-hmm. um, and it's got to agree with everything else we got. Uh, got going on in life so we'll uh we'll see but cross that bridge and you get to it well yeah i hope we did uh we got a little off subject here at the end but i hope we did a good job of um kind of um explaining why bigger is not always better i think we did a good job and that's all that really matters um <laughs> <laughs> he's saying you're the only person that's gonna the only person that's gonna listen to this i'm the only person that has to listen to it <laughs> well no it's 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 good food for thought for everybody if they're sizing a job or, or if they're looking to expand their business or yeah i think it, it comes down to you need to know what you're going to be doing right with whatever it is it's, and that's how it carries over to other yeah well it's custom work or production work or or, or you know big time excavating work mm-hmm um, everything needs to be sized appropriately to do it. You know, and, and one thing we didn't discuss is whether or not the job's got a timeline. Right. You know, most of the jobs we do is just get it done as fast as you can. There's no set line. You know, some of these, like my buddy Brett gets into some of these jobs, it's July 19th, it's got to be done Yeah. no or matter else. what. Yeah. And if there's penalties for that, well, now it's time to start hauling in the big equipment and getting this knocked out. Who cares about fuel yeah. burn efficiencies? That nice. trumps the deadline. That's always been weird to me too, because I had the company I used to work for. We had a um, a port in um, God, what's it called? In Bristol, Pennsylvania, and uh, we would bring in gypsum powder for concrete, and they had barges come in, and they didn't own the barge, but they owned the port, and they're being fined by the port authority if that barge is sitting in their port for any longer than it's supposed to be. Really? Yeah, and I'm like, well, you're. Obviously, it, it's there longer because something broke or something like that. And now you're going to tack on $1,000 a day. <laughs> this is really, this makes sense. Yeah, okay. Oh, is anything in this crazy world make sense anymore? Uh, certainly not anymore. So, well, I think we can wrap this one up. Do um, yep. you guys got another topic you want us to cover? Guest you want us to cover? Yeah. Uh, comment down below or, or drop us an email at a few points from perfect at yahoo.com. Yep, yep. Uh, still got some more stuff lined up. Yeah, um, hopefully uh, at least one more to record this session, yep. at least. And um, then uh, hopefully we'll be able to get a few more. This is going to probably be a, a winter season type thing. We get so busy in the summer and chaos and everything, it's hard yeah. to keep going. But if you guys keep listening, we'll keep uh, we'll keep recording. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll have to be out here a few times in the summer because i got work to do on property. So uh, Get a few of them recorded then. And, yeah. But, yeah, we're, we got a few ideas of our own. We're uh, – we're all ears for our, um, suggestions. All ears for suggestions, and I think we're going to call it a wrap. Yep. See you in the next one.